you're on a boat. It, there's a bunch of holes in it. Um, and then also like the flag is messed up. A lot of people are like, how do I optimize my performance? That's fixing the flag so the boat goes faster. It doesn't matter how fast the boat's going if it's sinking because you didn't plug the holes. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is all about burnout. What are the different types of burnout? What types of people experience burnout? What are the techniques on how to manage burnout? And so much more. Our guest today is Emily Ballesteros. Emily is a burnout management coach, helping busy professionals create work-life balance to have time and energy to enjoy their lives. Her future book, The Cure for Burnout, is a deep dive into burnout, how we suffer from it in our personal and professional lives, and what we can do to defeat it for good. Hello, Emily. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here. So I'm curious, what is your story and how did you become a burnout coach? Yeah, very unorthodox path. So um, I found the niche of burnout or the niche of burnout found me after I burned myself out for two years. Um, I was working full-time in corporate training and development. I was in graduate school full-time attending in-person night classes. Um, I was coaching part-time through an online platform and I was commuting two to three hours a day. So I was burning out by volume, which is one of the three types of ways that people burn themselves out most often. And it got to the point where I was looking forward to getting migraines or getting getting sick because I just needed something to take me out for a little bit so that I could not take care of a responsibility for like 10 minutes. And that is a huge red flag for burnout. Your life should never feel so out of your control that you're looking for injury or illness to give you that break. Yeah, Um, definitely. So that's a great indicator for anyone who might have felt that way. And um, I worked in corporate training. So I figured somebody somewhere has to have come up with something at this point that would alleviate burnout or create work-life balance. Um, And this was pre-COVID, so the workspace hadn't even transformed as much as it has now, but even the resources that existed then didn't necessarily cater to the digital working experience that we were seeing in the modern working world. Um, And so I decided I had the personal and professional experience to then do the research, create a one-on-one coaching program at first around burnout management and creating work-life balance. Um, It's the most responsible way typically to make sure your methodology is really sound, that people are getting the results that you're saying that they'll get. And just to get that really direct feedback, people do not hesitate to tell you what they think. So Mm -hmm. that is the best way to make sure you have the best thing. Um, And then from there, I transitioned to um, doing corporate training and um, having a course. And now I am writing a book. And so that is how I burned myself out. Now I'm trying to create resources (laughs) I wish existed. Um, you, You mentioned that you were doing all these things plus coaching. What type of coaching was it back then? Yeah, so I worked with um, a a business where basically you became certified as a coach with them and then they like pimped you out to organizations who wanted uh, professional development coaches. So professional coaching for, for corporate Yes. Um, I was actually working mostly with physicians, uh, which Mm. imposter syndrome went crazy, but um, I figured, you know, if I'm willing to do the research, I'm not just going to sit here and look confused. I'll make sure I give them something good to work with. So that was jumping in the deep end, baptism by fire into coaching. (laughs) Love that. Um, And then at what point, how long ago was it that you decided to pivot into being a burnout coach specifically? So independently, um, not doing this just through um, any kind of a traditional path. I've been doing it for about three years now. Um, and it's, you can't go back. I know a lot of people say once you do things your way and the way that you like to do, uh, then it's hard to transition back into a traditional setting. And, um, it's been, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Very, very so, low lows, but very high highs. When you said three years, was that before the pandemic that you started or was it yes. oh, kind of around the same time? Actually, you're right. Maybe my timing's a little off. Might have been longer than three years because, yes, this was happening before the pandemic as well. I see. Okay, interesting. And I'm curious, after the pandemic, has there been more burnout? Like, you know, I'm sure there's trends because, I yes, burnout is burnout, but how have things changed in in the workplace in the past few years? Yes. Um, So... 
I like to say it feels like burnout used to be this experience reserved for consultants working 100-hour weeks or people in the healthcare field working 24-hour shifts. Um, and since the pandemic, it felt like everybody was it, the buzzword kind of surfaced, but everybody started mm-hmm. to experience this burnout. It wasn't reserved for a select few. Now there's different, more niche types of burnout that you would experience in something like nursing or teaching or one of those um, niche areas. But oh, typically, like overall, I would say that just the number of people experiencing burnout for various reasons has definitely increased. Definitely. Yes. I feel like <laughs> it there's it almost seems impossible not to get burnt out by everything mm-hmm. that was happening in the world. Yeah. Um, but let's rewind to you. What is burnout? And also, what are the symptoms for burnout? Yeah. So the World Health Organization defines burnout as mismanaged stress for an extended period of time, workplace stress. Um, and I typically remove uh, burnout from just being isolated to the workplace because that ends up neglecting large groups that can very much experience burnout that just happens to be outside of the workplace, like being a student, like a medical Mm -hmm. student that isn't burnt out, um, stay-at-home parents, uh, people who are doing full-time volunteer work, things like that. Um, So that is the World Health Organization's definition. But for just kind of layman understanding, it is exhaustion, overextension, misalignment with the things in your life for an extended period of time um, that ends up resulting in Um, There are internal and external signs and symptoms. So internally, that might be increased anxiety, sense of dread, exhaustion before beginning your tasks. Externally, that might be things like disturbed sleep, change in appetite, social isolation, um, some kind of uh, chronic flare up. Like if you get chronic migraines, like I know I did, um, having those more often. There's a very extensive list Mm -hmm. that you guys can find online. But those are some uh, (laughs) starter symptoms. Yeah. And I asked you to list the symptoms just so that any listeners can maybe relate like, like, oh, I feel that way. Like experience of going through cycles of burnout where like you burn out and then you get better and then it happens again. And so it's, it's almost like it's, it can be never ending, right? If you don't know how to manage it well. Yeah. It's usually recurring in the people who do experience it because a lot of burnout comes from how we manage ourselves, um, not necessarily the external factors. Because you can have somebody who manages themselves in a very um, uh, kind of critical, like high expectation way, not always in a negative context, but somebody who drives themselves really hard, put them in a really peaceful position and they can still manage to burn themselves (laughs) out in it by overloading their plate or still having that intense internal dialogue. But likewise, people who run themselves really easily and peacefully, you can put them in a very stressful context and they'll still kind of uh, operate, manage themselves in a peaceful way. So a lot of it does come from how we manage ourselves. And typically we do that multiple times over the course of our lifetime. Yeah. So when you're saying that, it, you're saying it's the person, it's not the job or the task at hand. It's the person that that kind of leads to the burnout. So do you, what are the types of people who experience burnout most often and why? So I'll say it's nature and nurture. And so for the nature portion of it, of just what you're kind of like, that personality and demeanor, um, some characteristics usually are being um, a people pleaser, makes it very hard to um, have boundaries and reserve resources that you need for yourself so you don't overextend and burn out. Um, high achievers, of course, because they have that mentality of more, better, take every opportunity. It's personal failing if I don't have room for this thing. Um, and then those who struggle with the victim mentality, and maybe they've mm-hmm. tried solutions before to change their reality and they haven't worked. And so So they just feel like things just suck. Why even bother trying? And then they stop trying. And so they're stuck Mm -hmm. in that burnout. Wow. When you say those three things, I feel like I've been every, I can relate to all three of those, right? And I'm sure our listeners can as well. All right, let's take a break for today's sponsor, Babbel. For most of us, learning a second language in school wasn't exactly a high point in our academic life. I took four years of Spanish, and by now, I've forgotten most of it. Now, thanks to Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, there's an addictively fun and easy way to learn a new language. Whether you'll be traveling abroad, connecting with family, or you just have some free time, Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually use in the real world. I'm actually using Babbel to brush up on my Italian for my upcoming trip to 
Italy. I studied abroad in Milan in college, and back then I was able to speak basic Italian, from ordering food to asking a small music shop owner if I could rent a guitar, which I'm proud of. Years later, I've forgotten a lot of it, so I'm brushing up with Babbel's 15 minute lessons. In addition to lessons, Babbel offers learning through games, podcasts, videos, stories, and live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20 day money back guarantee. Right now, save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash TLL. That's B A B B E L dot com slash TLL for up to 60% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Do you want to go into how to heal from each of those? Yeah. I mean, there are so many directions yeah. we can go. Um, I know. It's because <laughs> I'm sure listeners are like, that's me. That's me too. Oh, yes. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah. Right? I mean, first, like, so there's the identifying, which we kind of talked about the signs and symptoms. So wherever you are, knowing your personal indicators when you start to slip into burnout. And then there is um, actually looking at the areas that you might need to adjust. So um, starting with those personal signs, yes, we listed the kind of clinical signs and symptoms, but you're probably going to have things that you do that you notice before those more clinical signs and symptoms um, that shout louder to you. So for example, when I start ordering more things online, um, when I'm Mm -hmm. ordering food out instead of cooking, um, when I am usually eating top ramen, um, if I am going to sleep past midnight, honestly, um, those things tell me some, I need to start paying attention because something might need to change. I am doing the things, my comfort things that mean that the rest of my life might not be the way that I like it to be or prefer it to be. Um, so what do you need to pay attention to? Uh, and so for other people, I know some people like listen to certain music or rewatch certain comfort shows or like start falling asleep on the couch or like take longer in their transition, sit in their car for longer. So notice those things in yourself. Um, and then there are these five areas of burnout management that work in tandem to alleviate burnout. Um, And you can look at these five at any given point in time and kind of call out to yourself, which of these could I be doing better that would help my circumstances? And so those five areas are mindset, which is that how you manage yourself and how you think about work um, and the ways that you might carry work outside of the work context and ruminate on work um, or talk about work outside of work and make it grow and make it a really big part, stressful part of your life. Um, Time management, of course, making sure that you are prioritizing what you want to prioritize, need to prioritize. Um, And then stress management. This should be taught in school, but it isn't. Everybody's just using a hodgepodge of what kept them safe or worked before as far as stress goes. And then boundaries, Um, which is my favorite area under burnout management because they're so hard, but they're so simple once you can do them well. Um, And then personal care, um, which is kind of the rebranding of self-care because self-care, usually when buzzwords are used too often, they start to mean nothing. And Mm -hmm. I know a lot of places will be like, make sure you're practicing self-care to take care of yourself, which is so vague and unhelpful for so many people. So when they, it's almost more harmful because they'll think I am practicing what I think self-care is and it's still not helping. It's not working. Um, And it can be additionally kind of uh, defeating or discouraging to feel like you are doing technically what you're told to do, but it's not having the intended result. So what is your definition of personal care then? So for personal care, I think it should be broken into three categories, maintenance, rest, and refill. Um, And I post about this like every weekend because every weekend I know I need the refresher of what am I doing under each category. Um, Otherwise, we have the tendency to lean too far into one and neglect another. So for maintenance, that's just being a really good parent to yourself. That's making sure you are getting enough sleep, drinking water, eating nutritious food, your space looks livable, you're going to your appointments that you need to go to, your Paying your bills. Maintenance is just being a good parent to yourself. And then we have rest. The only time you genuinely rest and like turn your brain off should not be when you're dead asleep. You need to have rest <laughs> that you do when you're waking hours. So any low energy tasks that you might enjoy. Um, and then you have refill. And those are the fun things that people typically look back at their life and think, okay, that's what made life worth living. It's this refill category where you're spending time with people you enjoy, you're getting new experiences, you're doing things that kind of light you up. And if you can do one thing in each category, 
on like each day you have off or scatter them throughout the days that you have off, a lot of times it keeps us from that, that, um, those categories keep us from spending the entire weekend watching Netflix or the entire Mm -hmm. weekend, um, cleaning the apartment because maybe the whole house is clean, but you didn't do anything to rest or refill, or you watched all of your show, but you're completely unprepared going into the week. And now you're going to be even more stressed. Yeah, I really like that. It it sounds super clear when you put it that way. Maintenance, rest, refill. We have to do something in each of those three. That's really helpful. Okay, let's go back to the different types of burnouts and the areas of burnout. Let's let's break burnout down a little bit more. Definitely. So for the three types of burnout, there is volume, which is the experience that I described, just that back to back to back Too much on your plate. Yes, definitely life feels out of your control. Um, And then boredom. Um, And this is something that a lot of people experience during the pandemic when a lot of the things that um, create that novelty and variety in their life were missing. And our brains love novelty and variety, keeps it from atrophying, just getting bored over time. So um, boredom is being uninspired um, and uninterested in a lot of elements of your life. And typically people who experience burnout by boredom feel stuck. And if you told them their life would look like exactly what it looks like now, a year or two from now, they would have like a slight existential crisis. Um, (laughs) And then there is social burnout. And this is common in people pleasers. This is Um, having more social asks than you have resources for. And typically these people will say yes to everything just because they aren't sure how to say no, feel bad saying no. And then they're left with nothing and they're just staying in kind of the state of depletion. Wow. I think of mothers (laughs) when I think of social burnout because Mm -hmm. everybody's asking something of you and you feel like you have to be a giver nonstop. Uh, Yeah. They're very clear. What about the areas of burnout? So for the areas... The way that they'll be applied to the different types of burnout is going to vary. So for example, in the five areas, there's the mindset, time management, stress management, boundaries, and personal care. If you're experiencing burnout by volume, then you probably will need to look at something like time management or boundaries because it's a matter of how much you're tangibly trying to cram on your plate. Um, If you're experiencing burnout by boredom, you might look at some of those same elements, but also personal care because it's not enough to have a bunch of variation, but it's all in one area of life. So like business or work is one area of life. And so your plate is full, but it's all with business. It has, you know, you're neglecting social and health and lifestyle and all of those interests. Um, And then for social burnout, that is a lot of boundaries um, and typically also some mindset and personal care. Okay. That makes sense. So basically each different type of burnout, you have to look at different areas to focus on. Especially, yes, that in combination with personality, because some things work more for others um, and know yourself and know what works for you, because some of this I, it's, it will click with you more. Like a lot of people who are really struggling with burnout, the last thing they want to hear is it's your mindset like that that makes them <laughs> like want to hit you, which is understandable. Yeah. So um, you, you start with wherever you think you can most sustainably maintain. Okay. Of those five areas, which is the hardest and which is the easiest? And and I did you say you recommend people to start with whatever is easiest or whatever works for them? Yeah, whatever they see as like the biggest hole in their boat. Like if like you're on a boat, it, there's a bunch of holes in it. Um, and then also like the flag is messed up. A lot of people are like, how do I optimize my performance? That's fixing the flag so the boat goes faster. It doesn't matter how fast the boat's going if it's sinking because you didn't plug mm-hmm. the holes. So right. where are your holes? <laughs> and um, I, see. I would say uh, that boundaries is probably the hardest because mindset is independent. Time management, it affects others, but it's mostly what you're managing. Stress management's independent. Personal care is independent. But boundaries, you're almost always setting boundaries with other people. And that's a, kind of a wild card. And that's where a lot of, it's a, it's a lot less tactical and more interpersonal. And so there are a lot of feelings involved. People, especially people pleasers are trying to read the room a lot more, anticipate people's responses, manage other people's responses. Um, and the kind of crux of boundaries is letting other people be responsible for themselves and you being responsible for you and your resources. And then it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Let's go deeper into that. Cause I know so many people have a difficulty setting healthy boundaries. Like what is your definition of healthy boundary? What is, you know, cause some people, they, they're too afraid to set a boundary cause they don't want to hurt someone's feelings. They don't want to step on people's toes, things like that. So let yeah. What are your thoughts? 
Definitely. Um, so to simplify boundaries from the like big bad thing that they feel like they are, I just say the boundary is a limit. And when you ha- we have limits because you have limited resources, everything that you are working with that you are giving to others or giving to like the work in front of you, your time, your energy, your money, your attention, all of those are limited. You don't have this bottomless pit of things to give. So you have to know when it comes to maybe your time, how much of this can I give away before I am in my reserves that I need to save for me um, and knowing what those indicators are that, okay, my, I'm getting double booked. I am like late for everything. I am missing dropping the ball on things. That's my time management indicator that I need to set a boundary here because that I, I've run out of what I have to give. And so in other areas of life as well, even though it feels less tangible than something like time, which is already kind of intangible, but knowing I have this much of my weekend to give to other people. And this is how much I'm going to need for personal recovery. Um, And so it's not personal. I'm not saying no, I'm not going to that because I hate you. I'm saying no, because I have to spend this time doing this thing for me. Otherwise, like other areas of my life become collateral damage. So it's knowing your limits and being okay with speaking up for them. And then really recognizing that a lot of times boundaries just aren't personal. Mm Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, I think knowing your limits is also something that takes time for someone to learn. They don't even know how much time they need for themselves because they're so used to giving it away. Um, So how do you recommend starting with even knowing your limit? What do you even need? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, no time like the present. So pay attention to like your, your patterns for the next I don't know, for the weekends, for the next month. And when do you feel best? How do you distribute your time when you feel best? When do you feel very drained or what do you dread doing? Um, And just note the things that you end up preferring doing. So a lot of people will feel obligated to go to big social gatherings, but they don't even like big social gatherings. They prefer Mm -hmm. one-on-one coffee dates. And so in those cases, when you're setting the boundary, it would just be redirection to, I can't make it to this, but are you free for coffee next weekend? I'd love to take you. At that point, usually people are like, I will buy your coffee. Please just, I can't go to this big social thing. Um, And so it's that knowing that there are a variety of ways you can actually set the boundary, but overall that being aware of what you need and and then just like time management, how there are indicators, there are boundary indicators. So if you feel anger or stress um, or kind of fight or flight when something is asked of you that might be a sign that you need to create a boundary with that thing because you don't have the resources to give for it and you're already dreading it Um, and then there will also be just indicators in your schedule like again being double booked um, and dropping the ball on things yeah it makes so much sense when you put it that way like you you will feel it (laughs) like your body will tell you whether it's excited or not excited right yeah and that's a great point of like people know But we tune out that intuition because we're taught to so young. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't matter what you want. You just do it because Mm -hmm. it's asked. And there's there's definitely a time to be selfless. But that time is not every day, all the time. Or you will, like, the essence of selflessness is, like, like you're not your lack, not lack of self, because that really puts a bad spin on selflessness, but it's putting yourself last, which there's a time to do. But if you put yourself last consistently, you will feel the repercussions. Oh, definitely. I'm... And this is all ingrained in our culture, our society, and how we're raised, even in school. Like, even if you don't feel like it, you have to finish this assignment or even, and parents will be like, you have to go hug this person, even if you don't feel like it, right? There's all these like things that are asking us to deny our own personal boundaries and our own, yeah. So what needs to be changed? How, I don't know, what, what is your you know, I'm talking about like, how do we prevent this mindset? Yeah. I really like that point that it starts young. Like it starts in school where it doesn't matter how you're feeling. You get the good grade. Like that means you're ambitious. And then when you get older and you're people pleasing in relationships, it's no wonder because we kind of learned that obedience equals love and respect. And when you're a kid, if you restrict obedience, like you're not obedient at school, you're not obedient at home, it feels like you're restricting love and respect. Um, And then you just move into the professional space and more adult relationships. And it can still feel like lack of obedience means lack of love and respect, uh, which is not the case. You have to decouple those things. And if you believe that they can't be decoupled, that just means there's more work to do uh, because that's only one way of showing love or respect. Um, But it's definitely not one is required for the other. Um, And so 
what can we do to address that? It really, I mean, it's hard because it's a personal journey to understand, okay, it's just, I've hit my limit. So I just have to articulate, like I've hit my limit and the people who have my best interest in mind will understand that, that you can't always be, do exactly what it is other people might want you to do. Um, and you're probably not, you know, pulling this card out every single day. So you're probably still showing up at a high quality in these other people's lives often enough that it still, like you're still a good person, friend, partner, whatever it is. Um, but it's finding in through just evidence and experience that it's okay to say no and people won't hate you for it. And you have to do this in a safe context, which means if you learn people pleasing from a certain group of people, you can't then hope that that group of people isn't going to give you the evidence that it's okay to not be people pleasing. Mm-hmm. Cause that's what they're, yeah, used they're already to. used to it. Right. Yeah. So you have to find a group of reasonable people who you can (laughs) say no to and set these boundaries with and then learn just through that evidence of experience. It's fine. And most people don't mind. That's a really good tip because I think a lot of people, when they're trying to make a change, they... It, it's so hard for them to set a boundary because like, for example, their family is so used to being them that it's that certain way. And so the tip is to, okay, try this in a new group <laughs> with different people first so that you get some practice before you can like gain the confidence to maybe do it everywhere else in your life. Definitely. Because that, especially if that's your first time getting feedback that this is or isn't okay. And so it, it, you have to have a certain amount of confidence and self-awareness, but confidence going in to say, I hear that this makes you unhappy. I still can't attend this thing this weekend. Not coming up with big elaborate excuses every time because no is a complete sentence, but I can't make it to this. I can do this other thing, or I can pop in for the first five minutes, or I can do this, mm. um, but I'm not able to do exactly what it is you hope to do. And then there's like the second layer of like guilt messaging and being able to combat that with your own internal voice, which is where that mindset comes in of this is reasonable. You know, if you threw it into that other reasonable group, you have evidence in that it's okay to set boundaries. They would think it's reasonable. It's just that in this setting, you do have to navigate it a little bit more strategically. I see. I mean, it sounds like you have to come prepared. <laughs> like you said, you oh, have to have, yes. right, like evidence and you have to believe that your what you're asking for is reasonable. Because I, I, I can already see people doubting themselves. Once, once they try to guilt trip you, then you're like, oh, maybe you're right. Maybe I'm asking for too much. So, so what, is, what is your advice with dealing with that and like staying strong <laughs> in your boundary? To really feel like have a safe kind of go-to thought, honestly, and like in your head. And well, as I would say mental and physical, mentally, no, like have something to let you know, you know, for this season of life, this is all I have to give. And I know that that might upset them because they would like more, but all I can do is a four out of 10 right now. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's not unreasonable. It's just for this season. Um, Or like, these are my kind of uh, my expectations and my, what I'm okay with in these situations. And I can go up to that point, but I can't go beyond that point. And if I can express that clearly, and then people just don't respect that boundary, that is reasonable. You can even bounce it off those other people to make sure it's reasonable. But if other people can't respect that reasonable boundary, then that's kind of, that's them. And you can't reach into somebody's mind and manage their experience as hard, Mm -hmm. as much as we might want to. We try to find the perfect words to say approximately the same thing. Um, But people are going to hear what they want to hear. Um, because their perception is their reality. So if they're perceiving like, oh, they're restricting me from like, not in these words, but they're restricting me from access to the resources that I'm used to having. Boundaries only upset people um, who were benefiting from you not having any. So it's hard, but so mentally go to that safe place of like, this is reasonable. And this is a hard conversation to have. I'm proud of myself for having it because it's hard. Um, But this is important for me to take care of myself and then physically create space. Like if you're in the middle of a really hard conversation, ask like, can I take five minutes to like step outside and then can we continue? Um, And don't be afraid to create that space for yourself. Because a lot of times that fear in the moment of like, what am I going to say? What if it blows up? All of that is a lot. So know that you can have that Mm -hmm. escape step out. That also usually works in a professional setting. Like, can I take a minute and then regroup and come back? Yeah. You also brought up a good point that you can't control what the other person is thinking or how they even respond. So you have to be in a way prepared for if they don't respond positively, like you have to be able to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. That's 
<laughs> that that's yes. also difficult, but it's something to ha- be aware of and know that you have to just accept it. Right? Definitely. That's that like storytelling where we try to predict what could happen. And a lot of times, and like I'm guilty of this, but people who are good at planning generally, they'll be like, I'm just preparing. Like I'm just preparing for what could happen. It's responsible of me to run through this scenario every way it could possibly pan out, everything they could possibly say. It's it's panned out for me a couple times like that before. And so it was beneficial. But and, and so it's even harder when you have evidence that like, yes, it's, I do need to mentally prepare for these things, but then you spend so much more time in that space, um, than you might need to, and you run through so many stressors that might never happen. And so then that stress follows you and <laughs> it makes it, it makes it bigger than it might need to be. Um, so yeah. catch yourself if you're okay. storytelling. <laughs> yeah, that can happen too. It's like an unnecessary stress. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the different ways to combat burnout because there's different scenarios, right? There's a scenario where you're like super burned out and you've been burning out for a long time. That's one scenario. And then another scenario is like, like, you know, you're, you're just beginning to burn out. How do you prevent that? So let's talk about those two first. Yeah. So burnout for a long period of time versus fresh burnout. So let's see, how would I address these differently? Well, typically my first question is, is the role you're in or is whatever is causing you burnout worth it to you to be in? Because there's a cost to every industry. Um, There's a cost to most things that we take on, whether that's like training for a marathon or like you really want to be in healthcare, but healthcare obviously comes with certain costs. Um, Is it worth it to you to stay there? And if not, what's your timeline for being unhappy? Um, So this is for people who've been there a long time and for people who are freshly burned out. But what can you imagine being here if things don't change in a year? And if a year like makes you want to throw up because that's just like such a long time to stay in this in this burnout funk, then keep bringing that down is six months still like, is, could you imagine this in six months or is that like too scary of a timeline because you couldn't imagine actually making a big change, like applying for a new role or really setting these hard boundaries, um, within that time frame. So what's your time frame for making a change? And then what kinds of changes would you need to make of the five areas of that I've listed? So mindset, time management, stress management, boundaries, personal care, what kind of changes do you need to make over the next couple months? And in doing that, if things haven't changed by like the six month mark, but you've done everything that you can think of in time management, you've talked to your manager about what you can do in regard to time management, you've plugged everything in, then you're going to have to kind of do another reevaluation at that point of, is it the role and the company? And like, I just don't click with this, or is it something that is on my end of the street that I need to keep working on? Or is it just a hard season that you push through? Because sometimes you're just like, it's not like I could have dropped out of grad school in the middle of grad school. I mean, I could have, but like, I I wanted to be there. It was just asking for a lot for me to be there. Um, So how can you then mindset wise have a just constant reminder, like this is temporary. I'm just pushing through until this other thing, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So bouncing through all of those different five areas that can then support wherever it is you're at. Um, So that's kind of the same answer for long-term burnout versus fresh burnout. But what's your timeline? Well, do you want to say what's your timeline? And then what changes do you need to make to make sure it's not on your side of the street that you're doing everything that you can? Yeah. I think that's so helpful that you do have those five areas because you can like just outlining them makes it clear what can be changed, what you can try at least. Because for me, for example, when I burn out, all I can think of is rest. Like, I don't really have like a better answer outside of that, but like the way you have those areas, that's like, oh, it's so clear now that you have a framework to, to work with. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and rest is a huge piece of it. And usually people ask, you know, how long does it take to actually rest and recover from burnout? And it's so hard because in the world we live in, we don't just get to turn everything off and genuinely decompress. And what's happening when we experience burnout, I mean, so many things are happening. So I'm going to give like the spark notes version, but basically your body is in this heightened state of like stress, fight or flight, mm-hmm. you just constantly have like this cortisol, sugars, like adrenaline, mm-hmm. like these hormones pumping through you too, because our body can't tell the difference between I'm in the middle of the woods and I see a bear. So I'm stressed and I'm sitting at my desk. So I, I'm getting, and I'm getting a lot of emails. So I'm stressed. 
we're going to have the same fight or flight response, but more often than not, um, we're sitting at our desk with the emails and we don't fight or we don't flight. We just sit and we just sit in that. And so our body's been working over time. And that's why a lot of people, when they finally do get that rest or they take like a week off or something, they end up getting sick because their body's finally like calming Mm -hmm. down. Um, and so then it's a matter of, can you reassure, like almost separating mind and body, can you reassure or reality and minded body, which will work in tandem, but reassure them that you're safe and you don't need to be in fight or flight. Like you can't just decompress and not be stressed and then jump right back into the stressor and think it'll be better. You can't heal in the environment that made you sick. So Mm -hmm. how many things need to change in order for you to, on a regular basis, more often than you're stressed, feel like peaceful and calm and like, okay, my nervous system is regulated and I'm not in this constant fight or flight. So how long will it take you then to create that and maintain that? And that's Mm -hmm. the question. I think that's a really good point you brought up is you can't heal in the <laughs> the same space that got you stressed. And I think what a lot of people get wrong is they 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 get stressed and then maybe they take a break and then they come back to the same exact thing. And then they so they get stressed again. So it seems like ideally you want to create sort of more of a balanced environment instead of just that stressful job or stressful, you know, whatever. Um, which is it the same system as just going through your five areas and adding them into your life? I like how do you create yes. that balanced Im- environment where you're not always in fight or flight? Yeah. Um, I would say that it's those five areas and it's also a lot of self-awareness and being willing to flex and know that different seasons will look different. But that's why you see like some people who are just in objectively very stressful roles and you ask them like how they how they do it and they just have a flow. Like they just have a groove that they no, even if the job is stressful and unpredictable, they know how to take care of themselves. They like do mm-hmm. their personal care before or after work. They still are social after work or they go like do things with their group on the weekend. Like they've found a flow that works for them. And so it's knowing, finding what will work for you. And so if you're constantly uh, like at war with the asks that are coming at you, like in this season, maybe you take a look at those asks. And if you can never see yourself finding peace with them, um, then they, that might not be sustainable. Right. <laughs> when you talk about that flow, I, I, so my question is, what do you think is the difference between being in that positive flow where you do have balance versus people who do things to numb their stress and their pain? Cause I, like, I think of these people who are like, they go party on the weekend and they, you know, like they can live a really fast life where they think they're in flow and they think they can handle it, but then it comes crashing down like a few years down the line. So, so what is the, how do you know whether you're in flow or whether you're just numbing the pain and pushing it further down? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of that just has to do with presence versus autopilot. So, um, if they're saying to themselves like multiple, and you don't know this unless you are the person, but saying to themselves multiple times a day, like, whoa, I love my life. Like I get to go to my spin class and then I get to go to these meetings for this job. I always said I wanted it and now I have it. And then I get to go home and like make dinner and like spend time, quality time with people I enjoy. If they're present in it, then that's one thing. But if you're an autopilot and you like really can't remember the details of the last couple months, cause you've just been blacked out in survival mode. Um, then that is just kind of that lack of presence. Um, but I I think that that makes the great point of bringing up like personal values and that there's no one right way, one size fits all balance because some people are like, I want, and you should, I mean, like the angry comments that I get are mostly from people who like think that I'm telling them they can't have the value of working all the time. If your value, your top values in life are just achievement and work and the things like that, that's fine. You, you're the only one that has to live your life. That's okay. But it doesn't mean that somebody else whose top values are spending time with friends and family and like reading that their values are worse than yours. Like if you're top, like um, the example that I'll give is um, I've worked with people who are in startups where when they started, their values were achievement and making a lot of money and there's no wrong values. Like that's fine. And so those were their top values. And so they were, they had those values hit. They were achieving a lot. They were growing a lot. They were doing all the things that they wanted to do and they were making a good amount of money. But then five years later, their values changed and they wanted freedom and connection. And they had no time to have that freedom or no time to connect with anybody. And so that job no longer fit with the values that they held in that season of life. So if you're what, depending on 
what it is you want to focus on just for this season. It doesn't have to be you pick your values now and those are your values for the rest of your life. But if you know for the rest of the year, like what is it, July? So July through December, I just want peace and calm, even if that means I have to say no to more things like projects at work or um, extracurricular items or you know remove myself from those groups I signed up for or kick this one part out of my business out. I need to do that for six months because this next season, this is what I'm focusing on. Then that is great. Alternatively, if your priority is growth, then okay, head down. It can be as hard as it needs to be. I'm going to do these things for the next X many months. um, And then I'll pop my head up, like set a reminder on my calendar to have a sit down with myself to see that I do what I needed to do, what's working, what's not working. Um, So it'll come down to if are you hitting your values for this season of life? Because it doesn't matter if you're hitting my values, which also removes a huge piece of judgment in the when people are talking about work life balance. There's not one right way. It's just are you hitting your values? And then the conversation ends. Right. I I love it. Recognizing that you can choose your values and they don't have to align with the values of the people outside. And also your values can change over time. That gives us so much freedom. Like it's, you know, like instead of feeling guilty for being lazy, if someone else's value is working hard and your value is peace, like there's no comparison, right? Yeah, And absolutely. vice versa, right? So I love it to each their own. Yeah. And that really, especially in the office dynamic, I think a lot of people are, um, they they think that there is that one size fits all. So it's like, oh, that person leaves at four instead of like, and they probably already came in at eight. So they probably worked a full day, but they're leaving early. So like I am better than them. And it's like, they're (laughs) actually happier than you though, because they're hitting their values. What is better? You know, if they're happy, they're happy. This also brings in this conversation about, um, the workplace now, because I do feel like things are changing in a big way, not just with like remote work, but also generational, right? Because I've heard from my friends, like Gen Z doesn't like to work. And people said that about millennials too. People were like, millennials don't want to work. And now Gen Z is even more free, right? They, they yeah. prioritize more of their like life and their joy. Yeah. What what are you seeing? Because there's clashing of values in the workplace now. Yes. Um, I really, I think it's exactly that. I think it's just difference in values and people wanting to prescribe what their value, what people's values should be. And so the best kind of blanket that I've seen for that is just companies that have a really clear culture. And so they can say, these are the values of the organization. Any one person in this organization should be able to recite what those values are and all of people's actions in that organization should reflect those values, which also leads to a lot more autonomy because you just trust trust each individual to make whatever choice aligns with that organization's values. Um, And so that's like a, a whole like corporate side of that. But yeah, it's just wanting to say these other people should hold the same values that and behave exactly how I want them to. And that's never the case. So it doesn't matter what other people's working styles are, if they still produce good work, like if they can do it in one hour and it takes somebody else eight hours. Great. Yeah. yeah I, cause I, I, I've been seeing that in, it, it is true. So you're saying someone with the hardworking mentality who expects that if you're young, you're supposed to like work really hard, but they see like someone, you know, a Gen Z or not work hard. It, like, there's that clash, but you're saying like, they have to just accept that it's okay. As long as that person's getting their job done. It's yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it shouldn't matter. Um, but it, it's really hard to, it's kind of like, you know, how, um, like parents will say, and I don't know how I'm on parent TikTok, but, um, I see these videos, <laughs> um, like a parent. So parents will be triggered by like their kids screaming and crying because they weren't allowed to scream and cry when they were a kid. So it's upsetting. Cause it's like, you don't get to do that because I didn't get to do that. And so it's like that in the workplace where it's like, you don't get to complain that you have to work a 10 hour day. Cause I had to work 10 hour days and nobody cared when I did it. So it's like this generational abuse down the line. Right. And we're trying to break those cycles because there's no reason it should continue if it was unhelpful and un- unhealthy in the first place. Yeah. And then just like with the parent-child dynamic, it feels like generations down the line are like sticking up their middle finger to like previous generations yeah. who had to deal with things. So it's true. I think we, with each generation, we just keep progressing. It's, I think yeah. it's just a natural progression. Definitely. And I think with the evolution of work, we're getting, um, we're, we're so much has changed that we wouldn't have thought could have changed without COVID and just structurally, um, but we're breaking down what we thought work was and the structure it could live in back or down to how small can we make work and make it fit into our life instead of structure our life around work. 
Exactly. That's a huge shift too, because work, especially in Western culture, was mo- it was who you were. <laughs> it's your yeah. whole day, right? You your life revolves around work, and then now we're getting a more flexible. Um, so, how do you see, for example, like with remote work that's getting more and more uh, popular? Is burn is there a specific like new types of burnout related to remote work? Because people are learning to set their their boundaries, right? It's like a new kind of challenge. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of the people that struggle the most with remote work, because there are some people who are like, this is the best I've ever been in my life. This is the most peace I felt. Um, But the people who tend to struggle with it are people who um, usually like struggle with boundaries. And so they don't know how to say no. They struggle to step away from their computer because they feel like if they miss a ping, the boss is going to assume they didn't work all day. Um, There's this like... uh, idea that, you know, you have nothing better to be doing. Like you're just sitting at home. So why wouldn't you be available to do this thing at this time? Or you're lucky to get to work from home. So you should be willing to make these extra sacrifices. If you can't untell those stories and find a safe, just as true belief that allows you to maintain reasonable boundaries and still get all of your work done, um, then it will, it, the, I would say media then is kind of the threat and stories that you're telling um, have that threat to spill into your life and create that burnout just because of that lack of separation between work and life. You have to have as much separation as if you left the office and can't take your laptop home with you during certain hours. We have to be able to be unavailable. Like availability culture is just one of the worst things I think to happen to us. It's true. It'd be like just instant, like being like expecting people to text you right back and checking your email right away. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, because we don't have that physical boundary of like going into the office and coming home, everything's digital and everything's ever flowing. So you have to create your own boundaries around like, you know, I'm not going to check my email from this time to this time. Don't, don't text me or I won't pick up your call during this time. Yes. So it, we have to normalize that a little yes, bit more. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And it can feel like shifting from saying like, oh, I can't, like, I actually can't do that to I won't. Like, uh, oh, I, yeah. I could, but I won't. And that's harder right. to say than I can't because I left that thing at the office. Um, and kind of having that, it, it really requires some strong boundaries and some good wordsmithing to uh, be able to appease people and still do a good job. A lot of people hear boundaries and they think, oh, you just don't want to do your full job. And it's like, no, you can do a good job within reasonable constraints. And if you can't do your job within this reasonable um, constraint, constraint that has a negative connotation, but if you can't do it, that's probably, you're probably being asked to do more than you could do within that context anyways. So that's a different conversation about workload. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Um, And then another thing that you reminded me of is like, you don't need to have an excuse. You don't need to have a reason Mm -hmm. for your boundary. Just say, I won't. I can't. Mm -hmm. I I decide. I choose not to. (laughs) And period. (laughs) No period. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm curious, what about your personal life? What does your work-life balance look like? Maybe walk us through like a typical day or week, whatever can paint that picture. Typically, I wake up at like seven to eight sometime in there. Depends on if I stayed up a little too late reading. Um, so I'll wake up around that time and I am not a morning person, so I can't wake up any earlier than that. I know some of you are troopers who wake up at like five. That yeah. could not be me. Not me at um, all. <laughs> you're so strong though. <laughs> um, and I have a morning routine. So I just make my coffee and I'll listen to usually a personal professional development book on Audible. Um, and then I have a morning meeting with myself. So I write down all my priorities for the day before I open my email and um, start actually organizing everything. Um, And then I will do the first half of my day. And that could be a variation of calls or working on my book um, or answering questions inside of my course, things like that. And then I'll usually do kind of a midday workout uh, just to get some movement in. How long, how long is the first shift of working? Um, usually until about 11. So like 8 to 11 or like a little bit after 8 to 11. And then um, after that, I will have calls. Um, typically, my clients will book calls in the afternoon or I'll book things in the afternoon um, until whenever it's done. Um, and so sometimes I can wrap that up really quickly because when I designed my business, I was like, I'm designing this to have as much freedom as possible. Um, and if I'm not, 
what am I doing? I could just go mm-hmm. work in an office. So yeah. um, I'll work until I finish all the work that I know I need to get done. And that was a huge thing for me was not manufacturing busyness because I was like, I need to work until five because everybody else is working until five. Um, and just breaking out of that, like changing your brags from like, I'm working as much as possible to like, I have as much freedom as possible because that's yeah. my value and it doesn't matter mm-hmm. how it looks from the outside. So do that. And then after work, um, I'll usually like make my emotional support, um, potato and like add like all the things that I like to it. And then I read, uh, if, I don't know if you can see the video, but I have a ton of books behind me. Love reading, um, or watch like a show with my fiance or something. And, and what time is that, that you start to like, you know, unwind and wind down? It depends. It can be, um, I also love grocery shopping. So a lot of times after I finish work to transition out of work, I'll just walk to the grocery store and like grab ingredients for dinner. Um, but anytime from honestly about three to some days I'll work till like seven, but usually after seven, my brain stops working or Mm -hmm. because I have the freedom to do this. And I wouldn't have been able to do this. I don't think in a professional setting or in a corporate setting. Um, if I don't feel like working for the afternoon, I just, won't. And then I can pick up at night when I get my second wind from like six to about maybe nine, um, sometime in there, if I'm like, it's really not happening. Cause it's better to work for one hour at hundred percent than for three hours at 30%. If I'm only working at 30%, really dragging myself, then I can just do one good hour later. That would have been equivalent to that anyways. Yeah. I I love that. Just like knowing where your energy is at and what you can do. Another thing that you brought up that reminded me of some, basically it reminded me that in an entrepreneur's journey, like most of us choose to become entrepreneurs or have our own, you know, we, we want to be able to build our own schedules and have some sort of freedom. That's why we chose to do this. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs fall into like your to-do list is endless Mm -hmm. and it it never ends. And then you can even work longer than most people work in their normal nine to five jobs. Um, so it, it really is learning to prioritize and be like, you know, set your own boundaries, set your, like just decide whether you want freedom, right? Because you know, you chose this for freedom and yet you find yourself working more. Like that's what I find definitely happens, right? When you don't have yeah. like an end date or your yeah, there's the to-do list is endless. Yeah. That's how I felt of, for a long time in the beginning. Um, yeah. I actually reburned myself out, which <laughs> sometimes is good because it makes me empathize. It gets me back in that headspace of, okay, this is what like the people that I'm helping are experiencing. So sometimes I'll even do it on purpose just to get back there. And then I just pull myself back out. But, um, I was manufacturing so much busyness and saying yes to everything because there's so there's so much potential fear in the first part of business because everything is new and it's still scary like down the line, but you just get used to it and you're like, oh, it's like send it. I'm just going to do my best and see what happens um, and you become okay with it. But yeah, I just... I I experienced what it was like if I went and gave 100% and it was too much. It was all too much. You end up working way more than you would in a corporate setting and way harder. And it's much much like scarier because everything is directly impacting you. Like in a corporation, you're kind of a piece of it. It's like, no, I messed this one thing up. I don't make money for the month. Like (laughs) it's different. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's important to just be aware of, you don't have to be 100% all day, like manufacturing busyness, as you said. Definitely do what works. Yeah. Um, so I do want to call out that you have a book coming out. It's called The Cure for Burnout. Um, can you share like maybe your favorite concept? Is there anything that you haven't talked about in the podcast yet that you want to share that's from your book? So many things. Um, <laughs> let's see what would be good. Hmm. Is there an area that you think would be most relevant um, between the mindset, time management, stress management, boundaries, or personal care? We talked a lot about boundaries, so let's move. Let's talk about, um, I mean, mindset. Let's talk about that one since it is your first one. Yeah, perfect. So for mindset, this is um, just it's kind of an example that goes along with what I was talking about. How mindset is you managing yourself, um, and so the example that I'll give is 
Like you could have two people go to a spa day and they have identical external treatments. They're having the exact same external experience, but one of the people internally, the way that they're managing themselves is they're thinking, this is so peaceful. I'm having a great time. I'm so glad I did this. I'm not worried about anything. Like this is the great way for me to spend like, you know, my one short life, all of that jazz. And then the other person internally is thinking, I have so much to do. I shouldn't have spent my money this way. I feel guilty for being here. I like, as soon as I finish this, I've got to go do these other things. They're making like a mental checklist. And so at the end of that experience, both people had identical external experiences. It's that internal management, the internal experience that ends up determining who is burned out at the end of the day. Um, And I really think that that just brings home that so much of it is that personal management. And if you can do that well, and you can just start to hear your thoughts, start to pay attention to how you're doing that, you can talk yourself down from most stressors. And uh, as much as we like to think it's all of these outside moving pieces, sometimes it, it definitely is, but it's like gentle parenting yourself through them makes it so much easier and better and more peaceful and creates a softer landing pad for you when things do get hard. Mm, yeah, because your peace ultimately comes from within. It, it starts with what you're telling yourself in your mind. I love talking about mindset because it, it really is like the starting point for how you experience your life. Like you said, you can have the same exact external experience, but it it's all sh- it all gets filtered through the mind. So yes. whether it, it's it's positive or negative, that's on you, actually. Definitely, that's actually mm-hmm. another concept where it's like if you, if you if people who for people who trouble or have trouble visualizing mindset, imagine that. The, with your thoughts or somebody strapped to your hip. Like, is that person an asshole? Like, is that somebody who's criticizing you and telling you to make yourself smaller and is embarrassed of you and is really hard on you? Um, and why would you want to be vulnerable, even just like with yourself, with that person strapped to you? Um, mm-hmm. And so there's so much vulnerability required in growth. Um, but why would you be if you've learned that person's just going to kind of slap my hand as opposed to that person being really supportive, comforting you, talking you through, like challenging you and making you better. So if your mindset was strapped to you, would you not like them? And that is usually a, okay, let's back it up and introduce some some different methods of personal management here. Right. Definitely. Awesome. Um, okay. So do you have any final advice for listeners who currently feel overwhelmed or burnt out? Yes. Um, I would say, well, first, way to do way to do the thing way to endure it because it sucks like I feel like something that I really needed somebody to tell me when I was so burnt out was like yeah your life fucking sucks right now <laughs> like it's really hard and anybody would be super burned out if they were in your position like I think when there's just that toxic positivity right away it was like ah you don't get it like you don't know how much this sucks um and so when you're in it I like to remember And that's why sometimes I'll burn myself out just to get back in that space, how (laughs) much it sucks. Um, Uh And then from there, once you've acknowledged like, okay, they see me, they hear me, um, then you can back it up and to do that, like, what? How, what's my timeline for being feeling like this? What might need to change? Look at those five areas and ask yourself what might need to shift um, and be really gentle with yourself when you do it, really kind to yourself because when you're already doing hard things, the last thing you need is to be hard on yourself. So what can you do and take responsibility for? And then what might be out of your control and being okay with the things that are out of your control and then potentially creating boundaries where needed, but you can do this. You have to do this because this is your one life. So you're going to do this. (laughs) Awesome. Okay. Emily, where can we find you online? I am on Instagram and TikTok and my handle is Emily B. Ruth, E-M-I-L-Y-B-R-U-T-H. And then from there, you can find links to my website um, with more information. I have like an email list with personal professional development um, and links to course and training and all of that jazz. Um, And then next year, I believe is when my book will come out. So um, more information on that in the future. Yeah, super excited for you, everyone. Make sure you check out Emily. I'll put all the links in the show notes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.